Hi there, I'm Pastor Steve, and this week we are going to be in the book of John, and we're going to bounce just a little bit. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 6 through 8, and then we're going to jump ahead to 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And that is the word of God for the people of God. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, may the words from my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here today, may they not only be acceptable, may they be pleasing to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, our sermon title today is Pointing Others to Christ. And many thanks to Adam Hamilton's book, by the way, Prepare the Way for the Lord, for for helping guide me in this sermon somewhat. John the Baptist is famous for many things, but His most important role is to point away from himself and toward Jesus. In our gospel lesson for today, John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God who who takes away the sin of the world. And so, he gives insight right at the very beginning of John's gospel into into how things will end and and why. Jesus will do a, a sacrificial death for the world's sins. And sure enough, Jesus' death occurs in the afternoon when the Passover lambs are killed in the temple. Jesus is the true Passover lamb. And John wants us to understand these things about Jesus as a a new and and better Exodus story. Just as God brought the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, God was now getting new people out of even older and darker slavery. But who are these new people? In the original Exodus story, Israel is rescued from the the dark powers of the world, which in that case meant the, the Egyptians under Pharaoh. But now, God's Lamb is going to take away the sin of the world itself. John 1, verses 12 and 13 says, To all who did receive him, referring to Jesus, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision or a parent's will, but born of God. Well, this means everybody. Not just those with a particular family tree or a fantastic achievement. Over and over in the Gospels, we see the ancient people of God 
especially their rulers and self-appointed guardians of tradition, missing the meaning of what Jesus is doing, while people on the margins, outside the boundaries, well, they seem to get the point and find themselves forgiven, healed, and born anew by God's transforming love. That's what John the Baptist wants us to get when he points Jesus as God's lamb, taking away the world's sin. People thought John the Baptist might be the Messiah, but he constantly said that, that he was not the one, but someone much more significant than he was on the way. Nearly everyone respected and admired John, yet he was unwilling to, to point to himself. They come running up to him saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. And I just love John's response. He says, he must become greater and I must become less. What if this were our goal in life? Maybe it is. When we humble ourselves and, and point to Jesus through our actions, kindness, thoughts, prayers, words, and, and lives, this is when we are most happy. This is when we're most alive. It quite literally is the, the fruit of our repentance, the reason we were created. The only thing that can truly satisfy us and enable us to live into whom we are supposed to be. It's the answer to the problems of the world and, and the problems in our minds. It frees us to be truly human and, and to love God and our fellow human beings. Notice how John the Baptist is first described in John's Gospel. Verses 6 through 8 say, There was a man sent from God named John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. One night I was awakened by the light of a full moon shining through my window in the middle of the night. It was bright enough to see our yard outside by its light, almost like daylight. I've been told that if you look at the moon through a telescope and, and the right lens, you can see the mountains on the moon, the edges of the craters, and, and even the American flag. Okay, not the American flag, but fantastic views of the mountains and craters. But if you do this, you must use a specific filter. If you don't have a filter on the lens, you'll hurt your eyes if you look too long because the moon is so bright. Yet, the moon doesn't produce light, it only reflects it. This was the role of John the Baptist, and this is to be our role as well. In our gospel lesson, something extraordinary is happening. God is coming to deliver, rescue, ransom, and redeem humankind, to make himself known to us, to show us mercy and grace, and to offer us eternal life. John came to testify about this light, to witness to Christ's light, to announce that the kingdom of heaven was near, that someone more significant than he was coming who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He came to call people to change their hearts and minds, to prepare for the coming of the King, the light of the world, the Word made flesh. Think of the darkness our world has been living through over the, the past few years. Darkness was us watching a, a million plus Americans die of COVID and, and the social isolation that, that the virus brought. And honestly, we still haven't gotten over it completely. The world became polarized over masks, school closings, and vaccines. Racial uprisings and political divisions are, are driving families apart along with churches and communities. The darkness is school shootings, mass shootings, 
and missiles attacking cities in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. The darkness is suicide, the second largest cause of death among our young people. We need that light of Christ, the true light that shines on all people. But, but Christ, the light, has come. Two thousand years ago he came. Our job as his church, as those who put our trust in him, is to reflect his light, bear witness to his light. It's to live as those who have heard John's message, asking God to change our hearts and minds and, and living differently in response. It's to bear fruit worthy of repentance. That's what we talked about last week. It's what John was inviting us to do when the crowds asked, what does it look like to repent, to prepare the way for the Lord? And John replied, whoever has two shirts must share with, with the one who has none. And whoever has food must do the same. In our gospel lesson, we're told that the, the leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to, to ask him who he is. And John shifts the questions about who he is to who Jesus is. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, John declares. Make straight the way for the Lord. I baptize with water. But one you do not know stands among you. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And when you think about it, John's been doing this his entire life. In Luke, we're told that when Mary, pregnant with John's cousin Jesus, entered Elizabeth's home, John leaped in his mother's womb. And because of this, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. You are blessed, indeed. Each year on Christmas Eve, we, we pretty much end the worship service by singing Silent Night and holding candles. By the time we're done singing, the, the candlelight has been passed to everyone, and and the whole area is filled with light. The sanctuary had been dark just a few moments before. One small candle appeared, representing the baby born in Bethlehem. But as we each accept the light, a miracle occurs. The sanctuary is filled with light. The light. This is God's strategy for pushing back the darkness in the world. And when we come to believe and begin to bear the fruit of repentance, we accept His light and we, and we do our best to reflect His light. We're called to let our light shine before others so they will see our good deeds and give glory to our Father in heaven. I want to invite every one of us to follow in the footsteps of John before I close. Now, what do I mean by that? Last year it was reported that, that for the first time in as long as anyone could remember, the number of Americans who were members of a church dropped below 50%, down from 76% just a few decades ago. Many who aren't involved in the church have faith in God and, and profess to be spiritual, but not religious. Most might attend a, a candlelight Christmas Eve service if someone they know, someone they respect and value, would just invite them. Many people have come to or, or returned to faith because someone invited them to church. I wonder if God is calling each one of us to be his messenger, his witness, to prepare the way of the Lord by inviting someone to Christmas Eve service. There may be someone in your sphere of influence or, or a bunch of people you might invite to, to join you for the Christmas Eve candlelight service here this year. So many times people say they can't come to worship service because, well, they have family or friends in town. Okay, 
Why not ask them to come? How might their lives be different if you invited them? And, and they said yes. We're meant to testify to the light with our actions and by our words and witness and invitation. Your mission, my mission, like John's, is to testify to the light. How will we testify to the light this Christmas? How will we prepare the way for the Lord to, to enter people's hearts? May God help us find the way. Amen. Well, that's our scripture and our, our message for today. I, I hope you're all well. I look forward to, to seeing you soon, hopefully. It's, it's always great when we cross paths. But uh, until then, stay connected with each other. Very, very important. But more importantly than that, stay connected with God. Bye for now.